welcome. I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, the closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Speaking of which, there's the news, and then there's SNL's Weekend Update, which says all the things about the news we generally can't. But now, from one anchor to another, our Tony DeCopel sat down with Michael Che, who's as soft-spoken as he is funny. Is that something you were looking for? No. You didn't want to make fun of guys like me on a weekly basis? I didn't want to have to read news. It's boring. <laughs> did you feel like when you got there, you had arrived and you fit? Or did you feel like at any moment, someone's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, sir, you don't belong? I still feel like at any moment, someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and say that. Still, this is like a very lucky thing to get to do, you know? Yeah. So I. If I'm found out at any moment, I'll be like, yeah, it's a good con. <laughs> There's more from the stand-up star a little later in the show. I think artists are a lot more sensitive because they hear a lot more criticism. Criticism's more vocal. I think businesses are using social media numbers and social media outrage as a way to curate what they spend money on and that's silly to me because it feels like they don't believe in anything. They don't believe in what they're putting out. They just are going by what they think people want. And it makes for a lazier brand of comedy. And there's not as much risk and there's not as much people making things that they actually believe in, whether people like it or not. I think all of that's true, but I don't really think of it as cancel culture. It's more like the business models changed. Then Faith Saley takes us to an exhibit that includes a rarely seen relic from one of the nation's most horrific nights. There was a lot of secrecy about getting this here. Yes, I, yes, I, absolutely. It, it came with an, you know, a police escort, and quite rightly, you know, it's, 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 it's a treasured object. The coach, created by Brooks Brothers for Lincoln's second inauguration, has never before left the D.C. area and is rarely shown to the public in order to protect its fragile nature. What's not on display is an embroidered message. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. SNL's Weekend Update has been around a long time, but no one has sat at the anchor desk longer than Michael Che. He's also SNL's first black head writer. But as our Tony DeCouple found out, all those accolades don't much interest Michael Che. He's more focused on getting audiences talking to one another and figuring out for himself what's next. From Saturday Night News headquarters, this is Weekend Update. It's the longest running sketch on Saturday Night Live. Good evening, I'm Chevy Chase, and you're not. And in the nearly 50 years of Weekend Update, some of comedy's greatest stars have taken a tour as host. It's Weekend Update with Colin Jost and Michael Che. But no one has done it quite like Michael Che. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame announced that Dolly Parton would be inducted this year, along with Eminem, Lionel Richie, and Carly Simon, which begs the question, what is rock and roll? <laughs> along with Colin Jost, his partner through eight seasons and counting, Che is now half of the longest serving fake news team in SNL history. According to officials at the CDC, the first case of Ebola in the U.S. has been diagnosed in Texas. And according to WebMD, you already have it. Is that something you were looking for? No. You didn't want to make fun of guys like me on a weekly basis? I didn't want to have to read news. It's boring. <laughs> Did you feel like when you got there, you had arrived and you fit? Or did you feel like at any moment, someone's gonna tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, sir, you don't belong? I still feel like at any moment, someone's gonna tap me on the shoulder and say that. Still, this is like a very lucky thing to get to do, you know? Yeah. So I, if I'm found out at any moment, I'd be like, yeah, it's a good con. <laughs> this is Black Jeopardy. Che is also one of SNL's head writers. Our contestants are Keely. A voice behind sketches like Black Shanice Jeopardy. And Doug. Which took off in 2016 doing, with Tom I'm Hanks as a white guy from the South with a lot in common okay, with his black co contestants. Big girls for 200. Okay, and the answer there skinny women can do this for you. 
Doug, what is not a damn thing? Yeah, you know what? Che will debut a whole new series of sketches in season two of his HBO show, That Damn Michael Che. My brother's a cop. Oh, really? Yeah. Featuring more yeah, of his signature of mix of Sorry. what's funny. Wait, so how does that happen? And also Absolutely. true. Like a person of color. Hey, could you stop calling us colored people? No, I said person of color. It's the same thing, man. We picked the color. It's black. Just call us black. Okay. Fine. Comedy is a magic trick, I think. I think it's truly a magic trick. It's, I'm trying to make you laugh at something you see every day or don't see, and you wouldn't expect to get that emotion out. I went to a Black Lives Matter rally right after that to support, but I, I must have gone too late. <laughs> it was all white women there. <laughs> they had signs, stop racism. I was like, who are you talking to? <laughs> Each other? Michael Che Campbell grew up in public housing on New York's Lower East Side. I was raised a poor black child. No, I was... Uh, Steve Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the jerk. No, I, um, I don't know. My childhood was... Well, I was the youngest of seven. Uh, my mother worked, like, three jobs. My parents were separated, not yet divorced. We were very poor. When did you realize you knew how to make people laugh? Maybe in school, when I was very curious and then I would realize being curious was funny to people like to grown-ups because an inquisitive child can really knock you on your heels you know and young Michael Che was indeed named after that other famous Che the controversial revolutionary Che Guevara fitting you might say for a sometimes controversial comedian I like it for maybe a very toxic reason I do think that controversy brings people to talking. And I think as long as people are talking, it's, it's not all that bad. We can't even agree on Black Lives Matter. That's a controversial statement. Black Lives Matter. That One of his best known routines as a stand-up is about Black Lives Matter. Black Lives exist, can we say that? Can we say? And of course, its occasional counterpart, all lives matter. Like, well, all lives matter. Really? Semantics? <laughs> that would be like if your wife came up to you and was like, do you love me? And you were like, baby, I love everybody. What are you talking about? <laughs> all right, let me get the door for you. For all his sketch well, work, stand-up was <laughs> Chase's first love. This is hot. This is a hot mic. That's a hot mic. And as we found on a recent visit back to Caroline's Comedy life. Club in New York. Yeah, isn't it a great view? This is a probably still his club. deepest as well. When you're as excited about what you're saying as they are, it, it, it feels good. It feels and stand-up is what got Che to SNL after Colin Joe spotted Che on a stage like this one and invited him on as a guest writer. Che went on to become the first black anchor of Weekend Update and first black head writer in the show's history. I'm just being me. Though he says those titles don't carry much weight with him. I don't know I'm black until you tell me. The world tells you you're black. The world tells you you're poor. The world tells you you're successful. The world tells you all of these things. When you wake up, you're not thinking about none of that stuff. I'm just trying to grow up and not get killed and just be a little bit happy. You know what I mean? Like, that's all you're looking for. Everybody else tells you what you are and who you represent. You're just trying to be funny. And though Che recently said this would be his last season with SNL. New York City will no longer require bars and restaurants to pretend to look at vaccination cards. <laughs> he now says he's not really sure. The city will be lifting its vaccine mandate for indoor dining and events. Finally, said the next variant. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I was at stand up and I was like, boy, I hate SNL. And then when I'm at SNL, I'm like, God, I don't want to be on the road. It's just what you do. Oh, that makes sense. But yeah, I am quitting this season to ask you a question. <laughs> no. I'm kidding. I have no idea what I'm doing, man. It's just, uh, I don't know. I'd like to do more stand-up. When you love comedy as much as Michael Che does, just being a part of it is not a consolation Thank prize. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's the whole dream come true. This is weird seeing you guys all in your masks, but, you know, this, this audience is fully vaxxed. 
uh, I don't really. And at just 38 years old, it's a dream Michael Che plans to hold on to. You know what? You know why I was skeptical? Because the vaccine was free. <laughs> free medicine in America? Uh, <laughs> since when? 40 years from now, God willing, we're all around. We will see Michael Che right here on a stage like this. Yeah, I'm a lifer. I'm lucky. One time she said... I'm lucky. I, f I, f I figured out what I like, and I get to do it. All right, let's cut it. Good night. <laughs> More from Michael Che coming up in just a few minutes. But up next, a trip to the mat for a grisly glimpse of history. Museums are a place to learn and a place to reflect. Faith Saley is about to show us one exhibit that may be hard to look at, but needs to be seen nonetheless. Some arrivals at this year's Met Gala at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City were greeted with a lot of fanfare. And some arrived undercover from a museum warehouse outside of Washington, D.C. There was a lot of secrecy about getting this here. Yes, I, yes, I, absolutely. It, it came with an, you know, a police escort. And quite rightly, you know, it's, 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 it's a treasured object. The treasured object is the coat that Abraham Lincoln was wearing on April 14th, 1865 the night he was assassinated at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. We have George Washington's coat, and then we have Lincoln's great coat. Andrew Bolton is head curator of the Met's Costume Institute. It's slightly an out-of-body experience to realize that this was worn by President Lincoln and the circumstances in which it was worn. Um, so it's just incredibly meaningful and very emotional, I think. The coat is part of the Met's new exhibit, In America, an Anthology of Fashion, which illuminates the complex history of our country through clothing. Sometimes the most moving stories are stories that are untold. And the story is, for many people, um, will be an untold story. Untold and unseen as well. Shortly after her husband's death, Mary Todd Lincoln gave it to their beloved doorman, Alphonse Don, whose family kept it for over a century before bequeathing it to Ford's Theater in 1968. The coat, created by Brooks Brothers for Lincoln's second inauguration, has never before left the D.C. area and is rarely shown to the public in order to protect its fragile nature. What's not on display is an embroidered message. But the inside of the coat is, is very meaningful because it has the inscription, One Country, One Destiny, which came from a speech from, from one of Lincoln's heroes. So it has this very personal message for Lincoln. And how symbolic for a man who had to probably carry such a complicated inner life. A absolutely, and it's obviously something he, that he spoke to Brooks Brothers about and Brooks Brothers came up with the idea of the lining. Perhaps the most moving aspect of the coat is the part that's not there, the lining that was soaked in Lincoln's blood. The sleeve has been severed because of the lining that has been cut away for relics and sold as relics. So the sort of gruesomeness and the sadness and the pathos of this particular piece all comes out when you see it. It makes you remember there was a human being in this. And I think that's what's interesting. Often when you see clothing, the absence of the body sometimes is more poetic than the presence of the body. You walk around the exhibition and you look at the George Washington coat, for example, or the coat worn by an enslaved man. The absence of that body somehow gives it almost more potency, I think. A historical document, a work of art, and a reminder of humanity. <laughs> After the break, more from our extended interview with Michael Che. We'll be right back. How hard it was to be a comedian and stand flat for Welcome back. As promised, here's more from Tony DeCopel and Michael Che. At what point then did you make the turn to coming to places like this, standing on stage and making people feel something? I, I was like 25 or 20, I think I was like 25, and I was like, um, I wasn't making much money. I was having kind of weird, odd jobs and 
all my friends were starting to graduate from school and get into their careers and I felt like I wasn't doing anything and I was maybe going to be what I was afraid of being, which was, you know, somebody that wasn't doing well. And, um, and I was like, you know what, at some point I got to start working on a career, so I should at least try everything I've ever wanted to try before I don't have time to try it. And then I started going to open mics just to try it. And I loved it, so I just was obsessed with it. And then things just started to work out. So this is a question that comedians probably hate, and you've yeah. probably been asked before, but I'll ask it anyway. Okay. If you ask people on the street what their biggest fear is, they'll say talking in public. Being a stand-up means talking in public, and you say you loved it. Yeah. What do you love about it? The view uh, was the first thing I loved about it, was looking out and seeing everyone smiling at you. It felt good. Do you remember some of your first jokes on stage? I remember it was like around Halloween time, and I was saying it was something like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses must love Halloween because people will actually answer the door. That was <laughs> that was like that. I think that might have been like the first month I was like really really excited about jokes like that. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was a rough start. Is it harder to do comedy today than it was? 10 years ago? No. No? You know, I used to take Lenny Bruce off stage in handcuffs for saying dirty words. Even yeah, those were particular dirty words in a particular law. It's and... dirty words that I use all the time. OK, so that's a marker of progress. Fine. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> you know, like Dick Gregory, used to, they used to like throw stuff at him and give him death threats. And how hard it was to be a comedian and stand flat-footed and say what you believed in the 60s and 50s and 40s and even sometimes in the 70s. Yeah. I'm fine. It's not harder. It's just, I think artists are a lot more sensitive because they hear a lot more criticism. Criticism is more vocal. I think businesses are using social media numbers and social media outrage as a way to curate what they spend money on. And that's silly to me because it feels like they don't believe in anything. They don't believe in what they're putting out. They just are going by what they think people want. And it makes for a lazier brand of comedy. And there's not as much risk and there's not as much people making things that they actually believe in, whether people like it or not. I think all of that's true, but I don't really think of it as cancel culture, it's more like the business model's changed. Hmm. Do you ignore reviews? Do you ignore social media comments? No, I don't ignore anything. It's my job to consume stuff and put it back out. So I, I, I can't ignore anything. So that's the headline, Michael Che will read your comment if you tell him you don't like his joke? I mean, there's some stuff I don't see, but yeah. I'll, I'll definitely take it all in. That's gotta hurt. So does jogging. So it's jogging. Yeah. So you think it's part of the training of being a comedian? It's part of it. OK. Yeah. You I don't like watching myself on camera because it's done and I can't improve it. But I do like the feedback. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Comedy is a magic trick, I think. I think it's truly a magic trick. It's I'm trying to make you laugh at something you see every day or don't see and you wouldn't expect to get that emotion out. You wouldn't expect to get laughter from a subject like that. I'm trying to find the funny in the subject that you wouldn't ordinarily see. And it could be something very painful. It could be something super mundane that we look at every day and like, oh, that is funny. Like, it's, it's all of that. So that's a scenario where it comes from pain. But it's still silly. It's still absurd. It still heightens. It's still a game. It's still sketch. We follow all the rules. There's no cut to camera and go to your local library and, you know, it's none of that. Uh, you are the first black head writer of SNL. Does it weigh on you? No. I don't, it's because it's a comedy job. It's like, what weighs on me is, is, it, is the show funny while I'm head writer? Am I, are we producing anything that's impactful, that people are laughing at, that people are talking about? Is the show still relevant? Are people checking on it? Like, that's, I, blackhead writer is like, I, I don't even know what that means. What does it, what does it mean? I don't know. That you're supposed to represent some viewpoint or, or something that someone else wouldn't have. 
Now that's different because I got I know black writers who grew up closer to how Colin grew up than how I grew up. So there's no black experience that's uniform. So I could be the first writer from the projects and then you could be a suburban Ivy League black kid that has a perspective that's more common to what's already it's always been on the show. You, you're or, talking. or there's some kids from maybe from Atlanta that's you know what I mean that has a southern perspective that's black just as black as me just as black as the Harvard girl who whatever like that's interesting so yeah, you're talking about the difference between class and race I'm talking about the difference between background culture yeah it's it's, it's not just skin color it's a lot of it's a diversity even amongst black people so totally to be the first doesn't mean much to me from the outside looking at you it feels like you have arrived where? Co-head writer of SNL, first black co-head writer, or head writer, period. Co-anchor of Weekend Update. You're on your second HBO special. You've done two Netflix specials. I'm sure I'm missing stuff. That doesn't seem like success to you? OK, yes. <laughs> no, it's, it's success. I, I don't want to sound ungrateful. It's a, it's, I've gotten to do a lot of stuff, but that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just. The, the next joke that I'm trying to write, I'm trying to make it funny. Like, that's the success. Everything else is like, you know, lucky. So you don't feel like you've made it? That's more about what it is. It's, a, it's every day, it's maintaining it. It's not like you, you did it, you, you won the diet, or you won the relationship. It's like, that's all hindsight sh stuff. That's not practical to keep going. So you. Yeah, all of that stuff is nice to think about, but you still have today and tomorrow. So you can't think about that. There's no made it. It's what do you like to do and how do you sustain doing it? And you feel like if you don't work at sustaining doing it, this could fall away? Of course, it could, absolutely. It goes away even when you're doing it. If you don't do it to a good enough standard, it could go away. It's, it's all could go away. I, don't, I mean, not really. You could be doing, you could be booking shows. If you, did, if you didn't write another joke the rest of your life. Dude, I'm one tweet away from it all going away anyway. Like it's, so we're all that, every single day. Exactly. So what am I talking about made it if I lose it? Yeah, I guess you're right. If I can lose it, then I haven't <laughs> made it. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time right here on Here Comes the Sun.